Hello, welcome to Postcolonial Space. I'm Masood Raja. And what follows this introduction is a webinar that I had conducted previously, a live webinar. And I thought I should edit it and make it available to a wider audience. So without further ado, here is an edited webinar, and I hope you enjoy it. Thank you. So the book came out in 1983, and it was a huge book. Uh, Anderson previously was also already a pretty established scholar. He and three of his um, colleagues were already famous even as graduate students because they had published an article in 1971, but the article was researched in the late 60s in Indonesia and had dispelled all the narratives that the Sukarno regime had built about a certain uprising. And because of that, they were all evicted from, um, from Indonesia and they had to come back to America. So Imagined Communities was the first major text that challenges certain organic concept of nations, which we called organist nationalism or mechanistic concepts of nationalism like the Leviathan and others and argues and it um, it can start with it starts with you know three things that he is arguing now if you fam if you've read the book you will know that in the very beginning of the book uh, Anderson starts with three things that are specific to nationalism right and what are those three things? That nationalism is a recent phenomena. Okay, so cool. Um, so before I go there, I'm going to add Dr. Shahar to the screen. Yeah, hello, Dr. So she's here. So yeah, there'll be a bit of playback from your screen, if but that's okay. So you can introduce the class and. Uh, what the students are doing and then I can I can put you on the then I can take right. over. So sorry. Yeah. So uh, I think my class already knows that uh, today we have a class with Dr. Raja, a very eminent scholar of post-colonial studies, uh, teaching at uh, University of North Texas. And we are very lucky to have him here with us. And uh, we have been learning a lot, lot for him from him, and I hope that today's lecture is going to be amazing as well. I would ask uh, the class to keep on, please, asking the questions in comments so that uh, you know, uh, Dr. Raja, after his lecture, he could address them as well. So, thank you, sir, for giving us oh. your time. We can continue. Okay, thank you. Okay, so thank you so much, Dr. Sahar. So, uh, it's a pleasure. Uh, to be here and uh, also it's always a pleasure to interact with you know my Pakistani friends and students so as I was saying that it, it was a huge book and uh, so in the beginning in the introductory part he starts with three claims right one is that nations, nationalism, nation states are a new phenomenon, but each one of them imagines themselves to be ancient, creates the mythologies of a past. So the idea is that they always have this, what he calls, they imagine themselves in an empty homogenous time, a time that the whole nation seemed to have shared. And then from there, they move into the serial time in which the nation actually exists. So it's a new phenomena, a recent phenomena, but every nation thinks that it's it has ancient roots and it existed long ago. I mean, think of Pakistan, right? Uh, uh, came into being in 1947 or, uh, you know, a lot of our historians of Pakistan, Nostin Banatha, Jab Muhammad bin Qasim, Jaisat Sobara, Me, Sindh Me, Dakhil Hue. I mean, until 1940s, there was no concept of Pakistan. Until 1940, there was no concept of Pakistan. There was a concept of a Muslim exceptional identity upon which my book is based, but no concept of a separate nation state for Muslims of India. 1938 is when Iqbal writes an essay about it and makes a speech about it. But it, retroactively, as a nation, a lot of us go and think and 
we want to think of Mohenjo-daro and Harappa and the Indus River civilizations as Pakistani civilization because it's kind of imagining that we have always existed. That's what he's saying in part one of the one attribute of nations is that it's a recent phenomena, but most nations imagine themselves to be ancient, to have a long history. The second one um, is that nationalism in the current age is universal. Every person, every human being belongs to one nation or the other and claims that identity. Some of us belong to two, like people like me. Okay. And then the third claim that he makes is that nationalism is an idea for which people are willing to die. People are willing to put their lives on the line. Okay. And uh, famously in his book, he also claims that no one will do that for ISIS, uh, for uh, EU or European Union, but for their nation, they will do that. So these are the three attributes that he talks about in the very beginning. Now, I had already argued against his third claim in my first book because my idea was that now there are supranational identities for which people are willing to die. And we've already seen it. My last book was on one of those entities called ISIS. And there is this competition between the pull of the national identity and the return of the large dynastic imaginations of how the world ought to be run. We'll talk about that in a minute. So these are the three things that he talks about, right? And then he goes, is that what are the enabling conditions? What happens in the world for the rise of modern nationalism? And that, that there too, I kind of slightly dis agree with him, but I'll first give you what he says. Um, first of all, the pre-nationalistic idea, the world existed under dynastic rules. These were kings who governed large territories and thought that, that they had the divine right to rule. Second, all these empires or dynasties had a centralized sacred language, Arabic, you know, uh, Latin, right before that, you know, uh, the Greeks, the Romans. So there was a dynastic rule, mostly divinely sanctioned, right? And then they had a centralized language. And the people believed that, that the origin of humans and the world was at the same time, that the world comes to be and the humans are there. There was no claim of evolution and we joining the uh, world way later. Okay, now it's these three practices and ideas that die out, that are destroyed, and that gives rise to the modern concept of nations. Now, unlike people like Ernest Gellner, uh, theorists of nationalism, uh, people like even Anthony D. Smith, and quite a few others, I have some lectures on them on my channel, uh, who claim that the nationalist, the origin of nationalism is Europe and it is France and England, right, 17th century, and that's Eric Hobsbawm's work on nationalism. What Anderson is suggesting is that no, the actually the nationalism as we know it, nationalism connected to a nation state emerges outside Europe and it emerges in the Western hemisphere, in America, in Brazil, even in Haiti, right? These are the people who claim their own national identities in opposition to their mother countries. And then it travels back to the metropolitan where France, England and others then shape themselves into national governments, but they are still also empires. And then that idea travels to the colonies. That's the cartography that he give, gives of the rise of modern nationalism. Why does he call it the imagined communities? Okay, because what he's trying to suggest is that there is no organic, natural nation. Right. Nation is an imagined community. And the example that he uses is that if you're from any country and if you find out that something happened to a Pakistani somewhere or an American somewhere, you feel a certain kind of affinity. You feel a certain kind of anguish 
how do you feel that even if you might have never met this person, right? And that's where he says that the print capitalism plays a huge role. What does he mean by print capitalism? The rise of printing press, right? It does a few things, right? First of all, the printing press in Europe destroys the dynastic languages, their monopoly, because more, since it's driven by capitalistic demand and the printers want to publish things that more and more people should be able to read, mm -hmm. so they start publishing in what were called the vernacular languages, German, right, Italian, French, English. So what the printing press does is it creates a reading public also it enables circulation of knowledge and circulation of knowledge in vernacular languages, languages which were considered regional. And that is when the national languages emerge. English emerges as a language. And then two other genres of writing emerge, right? The first is the broadside, the newspaper, right? And what is peculiar about the newspaper is that it, they always have a national character, but they may not contain just the national news. On one page, on one broadsheet, on one hand, you'll see a national headline, then something happening elsewhere in the world. And it's that experience of opening that newspaper as a larger community and imagining immediately knowing where you belong. That That is the imagined community, me doing it in my, you know, over my morning coffee, you doing it in your home. So that is how print capitalism creates this idea, this imagination of a nation. The second is the novel as a genre of writing, right? So I think it's, I used to remember the page number, I think it's page 32, where he's talking about now an Indonesian writer, right? He gives us two instances, two speeches by two leaders. One of them is not speaking in nationalistic terms. The other one is appropriating the vocabularies of nationalism from Europe and translating them into the local parlance, right? That's how he's, he's saying that nationalism gets appropriated by local leaders. But that it's in the, what he says is it's in the pages of a novel when you follow the movements of a main character, that in the process of doing so, you also start becoming a part of that nation, that national landscape that is being presented there, right? And so that's what he means by imagined community. And so the more you read about, you know, the novels, about characters set in the setting, what you call your nation, more and more of it you imagine to be a part of, right? So, um, th so these are some of the things, you know, that he's talking about in the book. And I, I can answer any question about that. Now, Anderson also has other works, right? So one of the other most important works that he does, and I'm forgetting the title of it, it was a book chapter in which he also talks about diaspora nationalism, that how is it that these large diasporic communities in metropolitan cultures like the Jewish community here, the Hindu community here, even the Muslim community here, they always feel connected to the so-called motherland from where their parents came or they came. And part of it is the metropolitan pressure itself that kind of heightens that identity, maybe some form of longing for the primary culture, but also that most of these people tend to be more chauvinistic and conservative than their counterparts in the actual nations where they came from. And they invest heavily in those kind of nationalistic projects. So that also comes from Benedict Anderson. So overall, nation as an imagined community, you know, uh, gives us the literary scholars this tool to take the theories of nationalism and then emphasize the role of imagination and the act of reading itself, and then read the novels from that point of view. Now, I would like to point it out here, and I've done it in some of my published work as well, is that actually um, Timothy Brennan 
had also published an essay in Homi Baba's collected essays on nation and narration, in which he also talks about the role of imaginative literature in creating national consciousness. I have used his work and I think his work preceded Anderson's a little bit, but in his view, he's not imagining the role of the print capitalism or the novel or the reading public as Benedict Anderson does. So these are like some of my views on Anderson and I apologize if they're not clear because I haven't, I don't have access to my books right now. This is Saud, let me bring your question. Uh, let's bring the first question up. So to become a part of an imagined community is much like subject positions that become part of dominant discourses. Uh, I don't know, I mean, here, I mean, I mean, discourse, we are always in a discourse, right? So whether dominant or not, you can live in a nation and be part of a non-dominant discourse. You could be a minority group who feels not part of the nation, right? And that's another discursive position. That's another discursive identity. So the larger discourse, let's say if you are in Pakistan, I'm a Pakistani, that's discursively produced. What does it mean? You decide you must have an other so you impugn all your failures to powers outside. Maybe that's that's a discursive framework. But within those larger discourses, there, there are buried discourses. There are silenced discourses. You know, how do women imagine themselves as Pakistanis? Um, so, yes, you know, idea of nation then in one way or the other is also discursively produced. It depends on who has defined it. What texts are we using? What texts are being read? Who has the power to pronounce what a nation is? All of these discursive frameworks play a role in, in our imagining of a nation. Good question, though. So, so if a Muslim from India dies somewhere outside or in India, being in Hindus will never feel... Well, that's a huge generalization, and I disagree with it. Okay? Uh, Yes, if it's if you're talking about fundamentalist right-wing Hindus, absolutely not, right? But that's the case for fundamentalist right-wing Muslims too. If you are a Wahhabi militant, you won't care if I'm a Shia and I am dead, right? Or you won't care if I'm a woman and I am dead. So it, it's a subject position. But if you are a liberal Hindu and you're part of the Congress party, you're part of the educated, uh, or not even educated, the, the the left, right? You absolutely would consider Muslims your fellow citizens. You will probably cry, you will die. So this is a myth that we Pakistanis have created because we take the worst of other groups and amplify it and generalize it. So I completely disagree with that and I have reasons for it. Uh, and my main reason being that it's just like what you are doing is exactly what the American conservatives and right wing pundits over here do. They pick up the worst examples of Muslims and then generalize it to all the Muslims as if all Muslims are terrorists, as if Muslims are not capable of empathy for other than Muslims. So that's exactly the same thing. And I would uh, definitely request you to, you know, uh, stop thinking in these generalized terms and, and hone your thought to a point where you don't have to scapegoat a, a whole group of people and generalize them just to feel good. And the other thing is, if you are relying on these generalizations, other people are also making generalizations about you. Those are racist. How do you fight them? You can't have one generalization to argue your own point and then say, don't lump all us Muslims, not all of us are terrorists. That's not how it works. A discourse, a counter discourse always is subtle to specificities of people's situation. Now, had your question be, been the right wing fundamentalist Hindus probably will not feel that empathy, I would have agreed with you, right? So remember these generalizations, they only weaken your argument and make you, you know, look not very uh, convincing. Uh, 
So where does the idea of imagined community stand here? Well, I mean, it's still applicable. applicable. Uh, I think it's part of your question. So I think I've already answered that. Uh, next question. You talked about what is SAS? Did you, did you mean ISIS? Uma, Uma as a geographical. Yeah, it was, the, look, the concept is imagined that it's a one community of all the Muslims in the world who believes in one religion, practices it according to that. So there is that imagination and maybe there is fraternity and solidarity, but we also imagine that it existed at a time. There was a geographical empire, right? It had the same body of law. It had a central leadership, right? So both of those systems come combined. But the idea that all Muslims are a brotherhood and a sisterhood is deeply ideological. It comes from religion, right? Uh, and so we imagine the Ummah. Now, now, when you technically look at it, it doesn't exist. And maybe part of it is because of nationalism. And part of it is because regional identities won over, uh, over the larger dynastic identities or identities of Ummah. Uh, will it ever happen? I don't know. I, I would love to see a world in which all of us can travel freely from one part of the world to other, because I think in planetary terms, so the planet belongs to every single human being and animal that lives on it. And, and, and nationalism to me is kind of drawing lines on the map and then making the world a hard place and, and controlling people's movement. So I would, I would rather not have nations, but I would rather also not have religious or other empires or omas. I think one humanity on a planetary scale would work much better. But you know, who am I? No one listens to me anyway. So, uh, so umma is a divine community. Yes, people imagine it like that. But then, uh, what is a divine community? I mean, there is no definition of umma in the Quran. There is only the definition that all the Muslims are brothers and sisters, right? And, and if that is the fraternity that Muslims want, absolutely, then it becomes that kind of divinely ordained or divinely uh, uh, articulated community. But then there is, you know, it's not like we are the ones who came up with it. Uh, I mean, think of the Jew, uh, Jewish diaspora, okay? 2,000 years of you know, persecution all over the world, and they still maintain their Jewish identity, their idea of what constitutes being a Jew through rituals, through memory, through readings of the Torah, right, through synagogues. So do you think we Muslims have a strong uh, concept of divinely ordained identity? No one has it stronger than the Jewish people. Seven million of them were killed in Holocaust, and they still retain the idea of a loose, you know, Jewish identity. And then the Christians have it too. You know, the, what does Catholica mean? It means universal. So but long before we Muslims came along and decided that we were going to be an Ummah, the concept of, of the Catholica existed, the concept of the Jewish larger identity existed, and then, you know, other identities. So yes. It can be divinely ordained, but there are other divinely ordained supranational identities too. But when you asked your question, you didn't specify it. Okay, so in future, you know, be specific. People get you. Uh, people like us who work on the borders of cultures, we cannot afford these generalizations. You guys are lucky. You live in Pakistan. Uh, you know. Uh, in Pakistan, with a 99% homogenous community of religion dominant, dominated by mullahs and men, you can get away with saying a lot of stuff. People of like us who live in diverse cultures and have to incorporate the feelings and habits and thoughts of diverse groups in our classes, we can't afford to make these generalizations. Not that I would like to. So uh, thank you for clarifying that. Okay. Here's another question by Haroon. My question is that is, is imagined community a result of the sense of resisting against a certain idea or, or is it the reason behind the 
Uh, good. Uh, I honestly don't know. I mean, for Anderson, uh, the idea of the imagined community and the rise of national identities is predicated upon the fact the three things that he highlights whose function is weakened, right? So the dynastic empires die out. The sacred languages are replaced by what used to be called vernacular, right? And, and uh, third is, of course, rise of print capitalism. So what he's saying is there is a transition from these larger modes of thinking identity to national identity, right? So in that sense, the idea would be that we transition into national identity. But on the other hand, that doesn't presuppose that we can't think in supranational terms or we can't build larger than national identities. After all, you know, there is a European Union. It's not just an imagined community. It has a body of law. It has a parliament. It has open borders. So people have retained their national identities but have also created these supranational entities which actually function. So, okay, Faizan, Faizan has, in your opinion, what elements that are responsible for hybrid identity of a, like French Algerians? So, I mean, uh, there are no longer any Pete Noir, they were called the French Algerians because they all left and they burnt half of the country when they left. But at that time, when the, the Algeria's case was interesting because the French never saw it as a colony. The French saw it as part of France. That's why it was so hard and so politically um, fraught with danger for France to let Algeria go, right? So the French Algerians who lived there even though they lived in their separate towns, you can read Fanon for that, but they thought of themselves as French, okay? Um, the Algerians had representation in the French parliament, right? So when de Gaulle finally decides to let go of Algeria and Algerians win their freedom, there is a huge constituency in France, right? That is opposed to that. And the reason was that they saw themselves as French as well as as Algerians. Now, remember when the when the settled white settlers, French settlers from Algeria leave Algeria, they pretty much burn everything, hospitals, schools, the buildings that they... So Algeria was one of the very few nation states that emerges that had to build even the infrastructure. Uh, so... Did they think of themselves as Algerians? I don't know. I mean, they thought of themselves as French. And most Algerian elite also thought of themselves as French, right? But that they also thought of themselves as Arabs, right? So I think on the part of the natives, the identities were more hybrid, especially the elite, because they were Arab, but they were also French. I don't think so that the... Uh, the settlers, the European settlers in Algeria thought of themselves as Arabs. They probably thought of themselves as Algerians, right? Um, but I think they pretty much thought of themselves as French, but their identities were hybrid. They were living in a culture which was hybrid, right? So, I mean, think of it, who comes from there? Camus comes from there, right? Derrida comes from there. These are the people who grew up in French Algeria. Uh, so Derrida is a, a, a French Jew who was raised in Algeria, right? So that, how hybrid can you be in your identity? Um, so is is globalization also, I'm, and uh, I don't think so. I mean, globalization is a, is a political, economic, and cultural, right? So the economic globalization is reality as we exist in it, right? Um, it has rules, it has laws of trade, it impacts our lives, and it exists. It's tangible, right? Uh, now, cultural globalization, maybe part of it is imagined when we imagine that globally we are all humans, we have come together. So those are the imaginative aspects of it. But I think the imagined community part 
would would come would be as we draw away from economics and politics and move into the realm of culture and that's where we imagine a globalized world in which all of us can live with dignity as you know fellow human beings but as neoliberal globalization itself as an economic system with political ramifications is pretty real right and we can think of it differently that's where imagination comes but it exists you know viscerally it impacts our lives good questions okay but you can uh, when you use uh, benedict anderson you can you know you can argue um you know how to like okay if you're reading a pakistani novel written by a pakistani author what kind of an imagined community would emerge right um you know if you are reading a pakistani novel in english or if you're reading you know khuda ki basti or nadar log or udas nasle you know these are the novels of my own time uh, and intezar hussain or banu kusia even then you can see what kind of an imagined pakistan what kind of a view of lahore let's say raja gid would create right when you read the parts of lahore that imagined community is what you feel a part of right and it also is a part of pakistan okay so arun question i feel like imagined communities like muslim umma and orthodox hindu which is becoming more and more obvious are a result of hatred towards what they don't believe in um i i won't say hate it's like the idea is to seek you know some form of social identity right now the problem with nationalism has always been that that it must seek an other right now there are nations that have complex national identities which can live with with the differences now if you look at the indian constitution the reason they have been so successful was because they were able to cobble together a constitution which accounted for the diversity of india right and which didn't let it lapse into a majoritarian regime right with very strong states rights so if you look at the hindutva movement or the right wing hindu fundamentalists they they want a majoritarian state in which the dictate of the majority is what everyone else has to follow and that's destroying the beauty of india right india is one of the most complex democracies in the world and one of the most successful ones too right let's not forget that it's very easy to just you know impugn everything onto india it's one of the most successful post colonial nation states with the most complex culture right and they did that through their constitution and because their leaders knew that they could not build it into you know a one religion state even though you know they did implement hindi and all that right as a, so um hindu fundamentalists what 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 are they retrieving they are retrieving the concept of mahabharat that preexisted the advent of muslims right that's the history they want to mobilize and that is a supranational hindu identity what are they mobilizing it against against the nation state itself right and when they are doing it so what it must destroy it must destroy the consensus of a multi ethnic multi religious nation state right and whether it's of hatred or distrust i don't know but the idea is that they are retrieving a certain historical ideal against as the nation state as it exists against the constitutional civic state changing the civic structures to that so maybe there is some hate involved there too it's just like you know our taliban brothers and sisters right uh, they have this idea of islam they have this idea of islamic identity the borders do not matter to them so they feel that they are justified in coercing 
a whole nation into following their path, right? Uh, because their idea is that, you know, they are right, right? And that's why, and this is slightly off the point, that's why the, the verse that we usually think is peripheral to the Quran, La Ikraha Fiddin, there is no coercion in religion, is so crucial. And it, it struck me like about three years ago when I was thinking about it, because um, if there is coercion, if someone puts a gun to your head and tells you to pray and you do that, you have committed shirk because you did it of the fear of that person, right? That's why there is no coercion in religion. Every action that we follow should not be of the fear of people. It should be from the fear of God, because if you're doing it because of the fear of people, those people are forcing you to commit the most unforgivable sin, which is shirk. Um, Kurds are an ethnic group native to a mountainous region of Western Asia, which spans yeah, three countries, and they imagine themselves as a nation, right? And they have this imagined history. It relies on the history, Islamic history, Salahuddin Ayyubi and all. Um, and then they are divided into three nation states, you know, parts of Turkey, parts of Iran, four actually, parts of Iraq. Uh, and parts of Syria. Uh, so, but yes, as as a as a as a imagined community that thinks of itself as a nation, they constitute a nation, right? Uh, now the question is, can they move to the next phase and get a territory, right? Because remember what Anderson says is that nations have defined territories, right? And they end and they begin. So they need to have a geographic territory that they can call their own and where they are sovereign, right? They govern themselves. So that's another criteria. Uh, so how can they claim themselves as, because they, they have a history, they have an ethnic identity, right? And it, they also have a history of persecution. You'll have to go outside of Benedict Anderson to imagine their nationalism. You'll have to go to Ernest Renan, or uh, people who, who tell you that what role a historic imagination plays in thinking of yourself. But they have a history and they have, so they have objective differences from people with they live in. And then those objective differences become subjective in politics, right? So they have leaders who want a separate country. They, they claim to be culturally different from their Arab counterparts. And then they are also ostracized by the Arabs in, in and the Turks and everyone else that further enhances their idea of a communal identity. So there are a lot of uh, theories of nationalism. So you'll have to figure out which one applies to really under understand it. But imagined community in one way or the other will apply. Um, do you think that concept of imagine must not exist simply? What is your stance upon I have no stance. I mean, uh, to me, concepts are tools, right? I'm a scholar and a teacher. Concepts are tools. Theory is, as Deleuze famously says, a box of tools. Uh, you want to open a text, you use it. You don't use it. You just throw it away and move on. I, I have never given my allegiance to one single way of thought one single theorist. Sometimes I'm a Marxist. Sometimes I'm a cultural critic. Sometimes I use Foucault. So imagined community is a tool. I will use it if it's useful. I have used it when it was useful. When it's not useful, I'll move on to some other theorist. Um, it's good to be, uh, you know, peripatetic. It's good to not owe your allegiance to one system because then you can think on the edge of thought. Uh, because when we become part of one theory, um, Said would famously call it when affiliative structures become filiative, when they become primordial, when we was like, I can't think that thought because I'm Marxist. No, I'm more eclectic. So yeah, it exists. It's useful. Where it's not useful, you move on to the next theory. Right? That's the question. 
Uh, thank you. It was a uh, wonderful, wonderful lecture. I wanted my students to look back at this one quotation, and I would like you to say something about it if there is. I mean, like if you could elaborate it further, which of course you can. Uh, there is one. There is one big quote of Anderson here, which has been quoted over and over again, where uh, Anderson says uh, that I propose the following uh, definition for nation. It is imagined political community. Mm -hmm. So you know, there is not one thing on which it is made. It's Political community, imagine both inherently limited and sovereign. Yeah. So, Dr. Raja, how can it be inherently limited and sovereign at the bo at both so times, that, like simultaneously? Yeah. So, that's a very good question. So, uh, so it's imagined as we talked about limited because it must have a territory, right? A geographic territory. And, and within that, it, it should be sovereign. It should be able to decide its own. So what he's conflating then is the idea of nation and the nation state itself. So, uh, so it's a political community because it must have a political system, right? So we become nations. That's why when Anderson talks about rise of nationalism, he's talking about the Western hemisphere because here, America, Haiti, Brazil, these are the nations that actually are not just fighting that, oh, we are Americans, so we should have a separate nation. They they are they are part of, you know, not the Haitians, but others, they are part of the same uh, ethnic and racial group. But their fight is political. They have a territory and they they imagine themselves as a nation. We are Americans, we are Brazilian. And three, they want to be sovereign in that territory in opposition to the mother state from where they had come. So what he means by that is that to be, to be a fully constituted nation as we imagine it, these are some of the basic criteria that it must meet. Is It must be a political imagination of the nation, thinking of myself as a Pakistani, American or whatever. And it must be limited, limited in a sense that it must have a territory which has a border. And you know the moment you cross it that you're not within the body of your nation. And three, uh, that uh, it should be sovereign, that it should be able to make its own laws. Now, all of these things are debatable because the same Anderson who writes about this also goes on and writes about diasporic nationalism, right? So that means that you can leave your nation and live elsewhere and still be a part of it, right? But then there are other theorists, theorists of nation and not nation state and nationalism who argue that there can be nations within nations, right? But to argue that, then we will have to get away from this definition because then it can't be that they, they should be sovereign and limited. Then it will be they should have a, you know, a shared culture. They should have a shared imagination of the future. And if you read, let's say, like Anthony D. Smith, I think, uh, yeah, he, not Anthony D. Smith, there is another theorist whom I cited in one of my books who talks about uh, how does the idea of nationalism emerge in certain cases is that if there are two communities living together under the same system, they always have objective differences, right? And when they have those objective differences, they live with them, right? But when politics enters that, those objective differences are subjectivized. And when those objective, objective differences are subjectivized, that's when political national consciousness emerges. So that was Muslims and Hindus, right? This idea of irreconcilability of Muslims and Hindus was a political concept. It wasn't an organic concept. How do we start thinking that Hindus and Muslims could, their thoughts were irreconcilable because politics entered that. Before that, they lived in the same communities, right? They pretty much respected each other as individuals. Hindus went to their own temple. Muslims went to their own mosque. When it was the time for the prayer, the Hindus never beat their, played their music and all. They even do that now for each other, right? But when, when we came up with what we are ironically called the two-nation theory, uh, right? <laughs> 
the idea was that that idea of two nations needed to be constructed ideologically and politically. It didn't exist organically, right? These communities had lived together. They had died for each other in battles and wars, right? If you if you read the account of the rebellion in Awadh, right? When Hazrat Mahal rides in uh, rides into battle, most of our generals are Hindu, right? Ra, 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 Raja Ram's uh, Ram Singh, I think, was one of his generals who was offered, right, by the British that if you give up on the Queen and join us. You know, you can retain all your lands. And his answer to the, to them was that the land belongs to the queen. She gave it to me. You can take it. But my honor belongs to Hazrat Mahal. I will take exile with her. So these examples are always there. But politics then tells us this thought must be excluded to create an exclusive idea of the nation. So uh, I have another question. You're not. Yeah, I, I disagree. I mean, where he says that, uh, you know, people won't die for anything other than a nation. Like his famous example is who would die for EU, a European Union. And we have seen people dying for ideas larger than nation states and uh, nations, uh, you know, and it's not just uh, Muslims who are doing that. There are Christian missionaries who go out in dangerous places and die for a cause. Uh, there are people, you know, Marxists famously died for each other. I mean, think of where Che Guevara died, right? Was it in Bolivia, I think. That wasn't his country. He was from Argentina. Um, and then similarly, if you look at the current um, international terroristic groups, all of them are supranational groups. So I don't think so that this idea that nation is the only symbol for which people are willing to die holds because there are supranational entities for which people die. And I don't think so that should be the standard. I mean, my standard would be that it, it's, a cons it's, it's, a, it's a thing or an idea for which people would want to live for. And, but that's my idea. I'm not Benedict Anderson. Uh, I'm just an obscure scholar sitting in Texas. Even my own colleagues don't take me seriously. So don't worry about that. Was Benedict Anderson a Marxist? No, uh, not a Marxist. Um, uh, mostly culturalist. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to stop here because um, it's eight o'clock. So we've been going on for one hour. But thank you. Good questions. And I'm so proud of Dr. Sahar that she is giving you all a good education. So um, any final words? Thank uh, you so me? much. It, it was wonderful. It was wonderful. And I hope everything is so much clearer. And you have been so generous, Dr. Raja, to all of us in academia in Pakistan. I think your services, are they need to be acknowledged oh, all the time. You. because. Not everybody is like you, is always available to help and to teach oh, like this. Welcome. So thank you so much So for waking up in the morning uh, yeah. and uh, joining us. Yeah. <laughs> it's not you. easy waking up in the morning, I know that. Yeah. So yeah, okay. it's, it's been very, very eye-opening discussion today. Thank you. Thank you. And also, please keep in mind that this uh, will be available, right? Um, I've kept it unlisted. So you let me know if you would like me to just make it public and then I can just click on a thing and your students can access it on the YouTube uh, and it will be available for you. If you need to download it and uh, the YouTube doesn't allow you to download it, just let me know and I'll download it and send it to you. Uh, so that's all. Thank you so much for all your good questions and stay safe and take care of each other. Khuda Hafiz. Goodbye. So this concludes this edited version of the webinar. I hope it was useful to you. If you have any questions or concerns, please feel free to send them my way and I'll try to address them and answer them. Uh, I will keep posting more such materials both on the YouTube channel as well as on the podcast. Thank you so much for joining me today and as always, take care and peace and love.